here then. Great, I'll start. So, thanks for everyone for coming. I'm Richard Brown, the chairman of the Open SUSE project and QA technical lead for SUSE with Open QA. And I'm going to talk today about Open QA, how we're using it, and how other projects could also be using it for testing their stuff. And first, I kind of have to address the elephant in the room. You might have noticed this presentation doesn't just have an Open SUSE logo on it. And I'm kind of doubling here, because I first did this presentation with a fellow from Red Hat, Adam Williamson, who is also using OpenQA. They're using it for, for testing Fedora. And so things are a little bit different than the olden days where you know everything used to be like this. And instead, life is actually much more like this these days. And how the heck did we get there? What the heck is going on? what could possibly bring these two great enemies of open source together. And ultimately, the, the starting point of it is testing is hard. Everybody who's ever done anything with any software ever reaches some point where they realize it's impossible for them to test everything, everything they need to test, everything they want to test, and yet somehow they still have to deliver this software at a quality that works. And when you're looking at a, a scale of not just a, not just a single software project, but a distribution, it gets even more complicated. It gets even worse. In fact, it's absolutely downright terrible. Um, and first, I'm going to blame the upstreams, because I just saw Martin from KDE walk in. Um, <laughs> upstream projects are moving fast, really fast. You know, the kernel, kernel 4, they're basically pumping out a new minor version every three months. GNOME pumping out their new versions every six months. KDE every, well, three months for Plasma, two months for frameworks, I lose track. Hmm? One month for frameworks, even faster. And that's incredibly hard to track all of that stuff. Every time something changes, you have to worry about all the potential integration points. Even when those upstreams are being incredibly responsible and reliable, there's lots of stuff that they will be out of their scope, which us as distribution projects have to worry about. And when it's moving that quickly, your testing framework has to be able to keep up. Your testing tools have to be able to keep up. And that is an exceptionally hard pace to work at. At the same time, many of our users' expectations are equally moving faster and faster. This is a thing that the KDE are trying to deal with with things like Neon where there are definitely users out there who want the latest and greatest of everything as fast as they possibly can. We try and solve that with Tumbleweed. Arch solve that with Arch Linux. And then, of course, there's a lot of other various different means out there, OBS, Copper, PPA, AUR, for adding additional stuff on top to get that kind of pace of software delivery that, that users are very often asking for. You also have a bunch of users who don't want that and like it slower. That's a different story. And partly as a result of these two factors, but I think also maybe because you know we're developers and we just have a really bad habit of doing fun stuff because we find it interesting, distribution projects in particular are offering more and more stuff in more different ways. Just, you know, things like Fedora with their three different editions for workstation, cloud, and server, because that's their way of thinking they can model these problems of different users wanting different things at a different pace. We do it as well. We have Leap and we have Tumbleweed. And even beyond that, looking at things like modularization, in this case I mean like the Fedora idea of modularization where everything is sort of built as a module and basically Lego bricks is how people should be consuming this thing. Containers, Docker, Juice, all add extra layers to this. SUSE's moduling as well adds a whole other complete spectrum of potential ways that all of this software is going to be delivered and is meant to work together. And so you end up with something like this, which when I first put this slide together, that was basically my interpretation of my test plan. Um, <laughs> but in fact, it's also the, the same interpretation of most of our product requirement documents and most of our feature sets now. All of these things all have to somehow work together and we're not doing our job right if we can't make sure that we're actually delivering something that works like that. 
And that's an absolute nightmare because you've, you know, you've got to test every possible permutation that could possibly be there. And it's pretty much impossible. But whenever I talk to this to established guys out in the field, they say, well, we have all these wonderful new technologies and methodologies and concepts and just you know, follow, follow these ideas that you know, the DevOps guys are doing. Use containers for everything. Use Jenkins. Use you know, traditional CI2s. Use, use you know, Garrett. Use Docker. Use Docker. Use Docker. Use Docker. And these tools are great. But they typically solve problems for application and library developers. The sort of the bleeding edge, the, the first line, the ones who are, you know, the upstreams in many cases, of, you know, they're working on their one thing, and they need to test that one thing. And they test it in a nice environment, which is why something like Docker in particular really gets a lot of attention. But when we're building distributions, as much as we like to think of ourselves as developers, we don't really write code. That's not our first and primary purpose. We are distribution engineers. We build distributions. And ultimately, that's also what our users want us to do. That's what they're paying us for. It's what they're downloading our distributions for. They don't care if the code we deliver works. They care if it only works as part of that distribution. And so we have this responsibility to make sure that it's going to work in that scope that we're delivering it in. So if we're deciding to deliver it in some fancy different way, we have to make sure it works in that fancy different way. And if that fancy different way has 20 different ways of integrating with other modules and add-ons and God knows what else, we have to find a way of making sure that it works, which means we have to find a way of testing it, which means we need to have a testing tool that can test not just the individual little chunks, but the entire OS, the entire stack, as a cohesive product. And this is why OpenQA comes into the rescue. So OpenQA started by Bernard, who I can't see in the room. Um, and my slide deck doesn't work. There we go. In 2009, and its original goal was to primarily test operating systems. In fact, the GitHub project is still called OS Autoinst, which was basically OpenSUSE auto installing. And, and that was its sort of heart and soul initially. Um, from there, it developed into sort of more console testing, more GUI testing. And in this day and age, we're now using it for testing OpenSUSE Leap, Tumbleweed, Slee, and of course Fedora, using it for Fedora. And the main things that set it apart from all the other tools out there is kind of these four main things. It tests like a user. It thinks like a user, or we make it think like a user with our test suites, and it primarily approaches the product under testing the same way a user is going to approach it. It doesn't touch any software directly. You don't need to know, teach it the APIs. You don't need to teach it some libraries or some framework or Qt or GTK. It controls the keyboard and the mouse the same way a user is going to want to use it when it's in their, in their hands actually running it. In order to actually figure out what the hell's going on, especially with the graphical stuff, we use OpenCV to actually read the screen output and compare that to this concept that we have of predefined needles. The simplest way of describing it is it's a screenshot compare. But in reality, it's a little more nuanced because that screenshot compare can just select the areas of interest which we, the test writers, have said we want to know that this thing is there. And that is what OpenQA compares against. Make sure it's there. Because we're using OpenCV, this can be very, very fuzzy. And even that means that if you have a failure that is below your margin of acceptance, but are good enough that OpenCV can actually find something similar to what it was looking for, OpenQA basically also handles the, oh, this has changed, but I think it's now this. Could you just confirm? And it really kind of keeps that whole managing of screenshots that you would otherwise drive crazy when you have developers constantly changing how their UI looks. Keeps that workload down, so it's very easy to move everything along. and. In addition to all the graphical stuff, just like any decent testing framework should, OpenQA can read plain text off, off a serial console, and regex is a wonderful. So here's an example of a needle. Sorry about the example. Um, but the desktop selection screen in Leap, 
And this is actually how it works when testing a GNOME installation of OpenSUSE Leap. It gets to this point in the test. It's pressed the appropriate keyboard shortcuts in this case to make sure that GNOME is selected. That is all it's looking for, that green box, or the contents of that green box. If they're not there, the test fails. If they're there and they don't quite look right, the test fails. But it doesn't care about all that other stuff. So if our designers go and change the text at the top, the test doesn't care at this point. The user isn't necessarily going to care. Occasionally we have a look and make sure that it hasn't gone completely wrong. But the important part is we're testing, can they select the thing we want them to select? Open QA, make sure it's there. And the test moves on. But like I said, not just the graphical testing. We talk about this stuff because it's cool and nobody else does anything like it. But in the real world, not everything is graphical. And therefore, we do have pretty extensive support for testing console tests on a system under test. We basically have three kind of main ways of writing it. So OpenQA's test language is effectively its own uh, DSL these days. So it's Perl based, but we've basically written so many API functions now that we very rarely touch proper Perl. And you can write your scripts in that, tell OpenQA the steps that you would do on the console, and then OpenQA will do those steps on the console. And just check over the serial that the outputs are what it expects. However, if you don't want to bother learning all of that stuff, you can just give OpenQA arbitrary bash, Perl, Python, whatever script you want. And OpenQA can deliver that with one or two commands very simply implemented into a test suite to the system under test. So it effectively will download it, will run that script, and then can look for the output from that script. So very easy way of just doing stuff in the languages you're comfortable with rather than having to learn our own. And kind of as an extra variation of that, you can always do something nasty like a curled pipe bash and you know run that which for testing you know isn't necessarily a bad thing and that's the third at the bottom when it comes to then analyzing the outputs of those scripts you've got multiple options openqa has simple functions already there for simple string comparison if your test scripts produce junit OpenQA can already parse that JUnit and treat it like it was a native OpenQA test result. And you just see it on the, the dashboards and the tooling without any difference at all. Or if you want to be really fancy or you have a really complicated script, then there's nothing stopping you writing custom result analysis into the OpenQA DSL. So when your test unit runs, it runs its script, figures out all the output that it's interested in, and then you just teach OpenQA, okay, this is a pass, this is a failure, this is a soft failure, whatever. So to have a simple example, hopefully this will work, yep. So this is like the simplest example I could find where T telling OpenQA to pick the root console is that one line. You teach it to run a script, like in this case, zipper minus N in A2PS, it will do that, and because it's an assert script run, OpenQA will not just confirm that it ran it, but confirm that it ran it successfully with no error conditions, so already got a little bit of handling there to make sure that the package actually gets installed properly. Then we have another script run here where we're just curling suza.com and checking the HTML output, and then we're running A2PS against that, doing a little bit of magic and making sure the thing actually worked properly. So if there's only one thing you take away from this presentation today, please know OpenQA doesn't only do graphical testing. It can do whatever the heck you want. The graphical testing is just the core part we talk about the most. And there's no point just testing it. You've got to worry about actually how do you analyze and report the results afterwards. And OpenQA has quite a lot of work done in this area in the last two or three years. So. Obviously, if you're taking screenshots for analysis and you're doing scripts, you want to have a look at those screenshots, you want to have those logs. All of those can be stored into OpenQA. Every single test run also gets video recorded. It's a nice knock-on effect of doing the screenshot analysis. We can just tell each OpenQA, yeah, record all those frames, record it at this pace, and then encode it at the end. So that is an incredibly useful and fun, not, not well, incredibly fun debugging tool, but it, yeah, incredibly useful tool for figuring out those weird error conditions that you were never prepared to catch. 
OpenQA will do a very good job of saying, okay, something's wrong here, but you might not necessarily know exactly where it went wrong, especially if your needle is looking at something at you know, point 20, and it really broke at point 10, and you just didn't notice. So running the video through where you can actually see everything that OpenQA did, every key press, every mouse click, you can see exactly what's going on, where it's going wrong, and it's also then really good when you report the bug and the developer goes, no, works for me, and you say, well, here's the video that shows it's broken. But of course, not just showing off to them, you need to give the developer a way of actually looking at it and reproducing it too. So regardless of which build system you're talking with OpenQA or you know, OBS or uh, I've forgotten the name of the Fedora one, uh, then OpenQA will keep a copy of the ISOs or the disk images that it's using and that it's producing. So with OpenQA, we do a lot of testing with VMs and OpenQA will actually store the disk images afterwards so you can then have, an, have another look at them, do more reproduction work on them, have a developer figure out what's going wrong. And then ultimately for managers, release managers, release engineers, we have a very nice dashboard for checking kind of the entire status of the whole product has been declared in OpenQA from the sort of test plan perspective. Um, the example for, for Leap is this, and yeah, I took this a few weeks ago now, and unfortunately we've completely and utterly revamped all of this. So it's completely changed in terms of the color coding and the structure and the fonts and blah, but I couldn't be bothered to re redo it. But generally speaking, it's still the same thing, so we have Various different products under test, so SLE 12, uh, SLE 12, OpenSUSE 42.1 maintenance, which is just testing individual maintenance updates going in through the OpenSUSE maintenance process. This is testing all of the test updates in the channel in one go, so it's, a comp it's effectively treated as a different product in order to give it a different test plan and a different way of doing things. These are the ones we've released. And yes, when I took this, we had everything fine in testing, but when we released it, something broke. And then at the bottom there is Tumbleweed. And as new builds are produced, as OBS produces new ISOs, this is constantly being updated. Test start, test run, test pass, and test fail. So very easy to just have a quick look and you see a complete overview of the status of all of your products under testing. Of course, you don't really necessarily care about Historical stuff, you really want to know what's in that latest build of that latest product. And this is a copy of, of SLE 12 SP2 right now, just about, uh, where we actually have multiple architectures. So we've got AR64 under testing, PowerPC, S390, and x86-64. OpenQA can handle all those different architectures in VMs or against real hardware. And whenever we can do all of them with the same test, with exactly the same test, that's exactly what we do. So we're quite happy testing RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 10 on all the architectures where we can easily run it and easily support it. And then that's great because when one of these green dots turns into red or orange, but only in one architecture, then you know immediately you have an architecture specific bug, um, regardless of where it happened. And then Testing things like all patterns, automatic upgrades with open with auto yes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing that's really nice to note here is when something goes wrong, OpenQA will be able to tell you which test module it went wrong in. So you can immediately jump and say, okay, the installation overview here is broken on all patterns on S390 without even clicking into the thing. But if you do click into it, you go down one level deeper and you get this nice view of the actual results for that specific test run. Um, this also recently got updated, but it's mostly just a polish and a tidy up with the fonts, colors, etc. Where you can see the screenshots involved. If there was console tests, I didn't actually have any in this example, the console test would actually appear here and you'd get the text snip snippet of the, the console bit in question. And you can see all the screenshots. You can see these ones with the green border. They're the ones where the needles were checked, the needles were matched, and everything's fine. For those times where we just want to take a screenshot for you know, basic analysis purposes, there's the support there for that. So we can just keep an eye on things, but we won't actually tell OpenQA to do a needle analysis. 
when something goes wrong, you can then dig, dig one level deeper and you get this lovely visual diff feature. So in this example here, we have an OpenSUSE Leap 42.2 machine. It's, this is what the screenshot says. And this needle has failed. It wasn't what was expected. OpenQA has declared this is wrong and stopped the test after this. And, but it looks fine. It, you know, you can't see anything wrong with it. It's a grub window. There's boot from hard disk, there's installation. And in the area in the gray, which is outside of the needle area where it's looking, you can still even see the upgrade menu item. So everything looks fine. And this kind of stuff confuses people when they first get to OpenCurve, like, why did that fail? Well, that orange bar at the end can be dragged along. And as you drag it along, you see on the left-hand side the needle, the reference screenshot that OpenQA was expecting. And on the right-hand side, you see what it found and the fact that it was a 67% match. And if you move it a little bit further along, you see exactly what the problem is. In this test run, I tested Leap. When I was telling OpenQA, it was meant to be testing Tumbleweed. So it was expecting a Tumbleweed screenshot. It was expecting Tumbleweed version of GNOME, of Grub. And so it got the wrong thing. It failed. It stopped. This kind of thing is incredibly useful. But like I say, not just the visual stuff. So we also have all of the logs recorded here. And we actually have API calls in OpenQA to arbitrarily add additional log information and upload it here. So for example, any time YAS crashes ever, uh, or has, does anything we don't expect, it'll upload a version of the YAS, the Y2 logs, which contain everything our YAS developers ever need. Up, take a copy of it, upload it there, and then tag it with that specific module where it failed. So we can have a test module keep on going test 20 different things in YAST and just upload the logs for the four or five things that it found broken. And as well, at the bottom there, the assets, so you can actually see the exact ISO that we used in testing. This is really important with Tumbleweed and with Slee, because we quite often have a case where those code bases are moving quicker than we can really test. <laughs> so as we're testing, new stuff's getting checked in, then you know, our build service is discarded, the old builds that we didn't care about, well, we still might want to reproduce something on there. So OpenQA takes a copy, keeps it, stores it inside OpenQA. So all of this stuff ends up being quite a complicated infrastructure, but we've done our best to make it as simple as possible. And this is basically how it looks. You can install this all on one machine, um, but it's designed to be distributed. So. The OpenQA package that you see in Fedora or OpenSUSE is basically the web application and the REST API and the scheduler. And that's where you go to see the results, it's where you go to set up the test plan, and that's where the database is stored, which can be uh, SQL Plus or Postgres. Then you actually have separately workers, which are system D services, which are responsible for talking to the web application to figure out what needs to be done, what needs to be tested. And you can have many, many workers, and they can be distributed across any number of machines that you want on any architecture that we support. And they're primarily doing that communication, figuring out, do they have jobs to run? If they do have jobs to run, they will then start OS Auto Inst, which is basically the test runner. And OS Auto Inst will then take the tests for that, te yeah, for that test run and then co connect to the system under test. In this example here, I've kept it simple and just put Kimu at the bottom. It's also the back end that we use the most in OpenQA, so we basically have these workers firing up Kimu VMs, testing in there. And the reason we pick Kimu rather than you know, a particular libvert or other configuration is this means we have tons of flexibility to do fancy stuff like add random devices, remove random devices, and test weird and wonderful stuff. All we have to do is teach OS Auto in just what we're interested in testing. But in addition to that, we have support for, uh, well, in fact, next slide, for testing on real hardware. So instead of using Kimu, we can use IPMI or talk to IPKVM devices. Um, we also have support for S390, so in that case we're using X3270 and talking to ZVM guests. 
So all collectively, we have support for multiple architectures over Intel, PPC, S390, and uh, Arch. We can do multi-machine testing, especially with the Kimo backend, where we can say, you know, fire up two or three VMs, use Open vSwitch, link these together in a bridge, make a network, and then start running your tests and synchronize them between each other. We even have a, a lock API, so one test can orchestrate the, the steps in another test run. So, you know, machine A can be told to get to a certain point and wait until machine B is ready, and then machine B will unlock machine A and carry forward. So all of that can be handled in you know, rather complicated test runs. We also have support for uh, chaining tests, running stuff in parallel, many-to-many -many mappings, all that kind of mad stuff for complicated scenarios. We have support for FedMessage, which is the Fedora message bus that they use for all of their infrastructure. And we also have support for well, creating disk images, which we use not just for reproduction now, but also for aiding in test orchestration. So, for example, you might do an installation test, make sure that's clean and valid, give it a green mark. If it's green, you save that as a disk image, which OpenQA can then use for subsequent testing. And it's either internally to OpenQA, or in fact, we publish those images publicly now, so developers can just download them and constantly get last known good sleep. Tumbleweed, of course, is that all the time. That's how Tumbleweed works. And that also means we're now using similar stuff for that for some of the multi-hypervisor testing we have, where we can test on KVM, on Zen, on VMware, on KVM for Z systems and Hyper-V, mostly using Libvirt. One of the other new features we spent a lot of time on lately is tagging, and we just tag everything now. Um, because having a dashboard is great where OpenQA has detected something, but you always need a little bit more information from a human at some point to figure out what's really gone wrong here. Is this a bug? Is the a bug in the product? Is it a bug in OpenQA? And therefore we've you know, taken the idea from GitHub and basically have the concept of tagging individual results in OpenQA as well as tagging builds, so we can say, you know, this this test run is you know is fine and it's related to, it's broken because of these bugs. These issues are all OpenQA's fault and they're being tracked in this tracker. We can also then take the entire build and say, this is an important build. This is a milestone. Um, we have an automatic infrastructure cleanup process in OpenQA to tidy up old builds we don't care about anymore. So it looks at that tag to make sure it doesn't clean up stuff that we still need. And yeah, basically make sure that everything stays clean and clear and well documented so you can see that not only is OpenQA done its job, but QA is doing its job and making sure that this stuff actually works. And so back to this example here. And I love this example because I hadn't seen one of these for ages. Um, that little lightning bolt is a symbol we use for when OpenQA has a bug. And so that test run failed because I broke something. This test run also failed because I broke something. So I did that one. I really had a good day that day. And this one here is the only bug in the product, <laughs> right on the end, just fitting on there, which was the one legitimate bug that OpenQA found. Um, and then, of course, the nice thing with this is also OpenQA can be aware of the bugs it found in previous test runs. So in the next build, it's going to run all this stuff again. And if the same thing happens at the same point, because it's figured out, oh, installation overviews when I failed or whatever, OpenQA can carry forward that tag automatically. So you're not having to spend all your time with manual reviewing, going through checking, OK, is this the same bug? Did it happen the same way? Whenever OpenQA can, it'll carry that stuff forward so you can see nice and quickly, yes, fine, they haven't fixed that issue in OpenQA. Or, yeah, yes, they fixed the issue in the product. And now, I'm going to talk about Fedora for a little bit. Fedora is a weird project. And I can say that because that's what Adam said on stage when he was, did this presentation the first time. They love their wiki. Their entire project does everything in their wiki. Every feature request, every discussion about that feature request, a huge amount of their internal planning, plotting, and QA, including the test plan and the results of the test plan and the discussion about the test plan, is done on lots and lots and lots and lots of wiki pages. And this is what they used to spend a huge amount of their time doing. 
was tracking all their manual testing in a wiki. So with OpenQA, they've now got to the point where about 40% of their validation tests, which Fedora run for all of their builds, are now fully automated in OpenQA. Exactly the same stuff they were doing, testing their installer, testing their OS, but completely in OpenQA and not using any of that lovely dashboard stuff I showed you, they instead copy it back into their wiki because that's how they like to do it, um, which is fine. I don't get it, but it makes them happy and they have pretty much the same kind of concepts now when it comes to the links and the, the statuses. They haven't figured out a way of pulling through tagging yet, I think, but I'm sure they're working on that. And so for them, where they're mainly working on Rawhide and Branched, so Rawhide is the nearest equivalent to what we used to have as factory, so a rolling development code base that isn't really ever designed to be working properly. Um, whereas Branched is their forked version of Rawhide, which is what they are stabilizing ready for the next version of Fedora, so effectively Fedora Next, but that's a different term for them. And they're building that constantly in their build systems and nightly producing a compose or their term for a build. That uses fed message to produce email results that fire everything out. And while they haven't got gating, which is, or we call it staging, um, which is a concept that we use, they're talking about it. But at the moment, they're primarily using it as a monitor to see how well are their nightly builds actually working. And they've ported all of this out into this web page. So on the left-hand side, you have a, an email you can subscribe to in a mailing list. And on the right-hand side, you have a nice web page that Adam's put together for the nightly compose finder, which basically shows you the last known good Fedora build every, every night, hopefully. Um, in fact, what they find is quite often the Nightly Compose will say, you know, the last known good one was three or four weeks ago. Um, and, you know, then they have, then they realize, okay, you have to go back, find where these bugs are and tidy everything up. And that's why they're interested in the gating or staging concept, which we use. So that's one of the big things they're thinking of for a new direction. They're also looking at testing their update images, which is how they do all their patches. They're, they're working on kickstart tests, which are very similar to our auto yast stuff installing updates, and they have a really interesting concept of, of testing as a service and kind of expanding OpenQA's current feature set so developers can more easily submit their tests to OpenQA direct without going through any kind of OpenQA vetting process and sort of using OpenQA as a service for developers to work on their stuff. Um, it's just a concept right now, but they're sharing some ideas with us, and it's, it's really quite interesting how they're thinking of handling that stuff, especially with how they handle package updates inside Fedora and stuff like that, and we'll see how that works in the future. When it comes to installing OpenQA on Fedora, um, unlike us, they actually have it in the distribution. We're still being rather naughty and leaving it in a develop project. Um, so if you're running Fedora 23 and above, you can actually install it just by doing a DNF in. Um, they have both the, uh, they have two versions that they're, they're running. They're running a staging system and a production system. In the Fedora data center, they've, they've done everything in Ansible, so they can very easily destroy their infrastructure, add new workers, add new servers, and just deploy it all with that. So they can yeah, rebuild it from scratch at will. And also, in theory, people can take their Ansible plays and set up their own exact clone copy, which is very similar to what we've done with our salt profiles, which is what we're using inside of for OpenQA. And their schedule is driven by FedMessage. Some of the features that they worked with us on lately, asset downloading and extracting, which with our, I haven't got the slide close, but with our infrastructure, our workers are primarily all on the same network, all using the same NFS share. In the case of Fedora, they really didn't want to do that and wanted to distribute as much of the ISO handling and the image handling onto the worker machines themselves, wherever they are. So in order for that to work, we've added that we've worked with them on the features to have asset downloading. So as you submit, as the test gets, as the test gets scheduled on a worker, the worker downloads the assets in question and runs everything locally. As I've mentioned a few times now, we have FedMessage support. This is actually the emitter, so OpenQA can tell FedMessage that it's finished testing something. 
They've worked on Dockerizing it, so you can install Open QA in the Docker container. We've both worked on packaging improvements because we've used RPM, so we've kind of normalized and standardized everything there. And there's been a really good collaboration over bugs and bug fixes inside OpenQA. But now, back to OpenSUSE. Actually, to SLE first. And SLE is now using OpenQA for testing every SLE release since SLE 11 SP4. And currently, it's sort of full stack testing from beginning to end. Every package submission going into SLE gets staged. And that staging concept is taking a submission into, from OBS. If anyone who's worked at Factory knows this, it's exactly the same. Something being submitted into the build service, taken into a different project, staged there, built separately, run very, very quickly in a, in a subset of the standard open QA tests. And then that is what's used to aid the reviewers when they're reviewing the submission. So before the, the new packages got anywhere near the code base, we know that it isn't going to invalidate the entire code base and blow up like the very basics of does it install, does it start, etc. So then it's accepted, it goes into sort of SLE proper, a build is produced, that build is then validated. In the past with manual testing, uh, QA would typically primarily only validate the builds that were going to be milestones. So you'd have a milestone like an alpha or beta every couple of weeks, and we would only manually test that. Well, with OpenQA, less humans are involved, and we validate everything that we can, so we're constantly validating every potential build. We still have the concept of milestones in, in SLE and with Leap, so when the validation is sufficiently good enough and the time is coming for an alpha or beta, et cetera, what those builds will then be declared as a milestone, and OpenQA can run additional testing on that afterwards as well. So we have sort of tiered testing of quick, fast, dirty stuff, the core base stuff of all the main functionality that we're interested in keeping running all the time, and then we do have some really nasty long-running tests that we use for post-validation that would take sort of two or three days to run. To be honest, actually, this post-validation line, quite often when I can get away with it, I run it all the time anyway. We just don't care about the results that much until the milestones hit. With Leap, everything's a little bit more complicated because we have the Susan Linux Enterprise code base as part of the core of Leap. And we have all of our open SUSE stuff from Tumbleweed or from previous versions of Leap. So you've got two code bases, but only one distribution which is a bit of a testing nightmare, really, um, because you've got you know, all these different potential changes coming from different locations, coming from different developers. But we found that the using OpenQA either in a, a SLE-esque style way, um, or sometimes even just a little bit lighter, um, is actually all we've needed to kind of keep track of all this stuff, because of course, Tumbleweed is being tested in OpenQA, SLE's being tested in OpenQA, so, the quality is good. We just need to make sure that then, second time round, we put it together again in a different way. It still all works together. And then, my one true love, tumbleweed, with always changing, always working, is really the the place where OpenQA earned its stripes, and also the place where OpenQA really, uh, yeah, really started. Because tumbleweed is OpenSUSE's rolling release, and without OpenQA it wouldn't be a rolling release. It would be some nasty development code base like Factory used to be. But you know, we want to make sure this thing works. We want to make sure people can use it and rely on it as their developer machine or as their power user machine. And so OpenQA is doing all of that in-depth testing all of the time, every day, as Tumbleweed is moving on. And right about now, actually, Dominic, is this right? Two or three days, roughly, between each snapshot? About two days, so yeah, every, every two days we typically release a new Tumbleweed snapshot, and simply put, a Tumbleweed snapshot isn't that dissimilar from a full-blown operating system release. It has a different FTP tree, it has a different ISO, with different version numbers, it's a full-blown distribution release, but we've cut it down to two days. And picking on Dominic again, because every week Dominic does these lovely uh, Tumbleweed reviews, uh, where he's sort of kind of covering what's the community been doing and what's Tumbleweed been changing, and a few months back, he made the lovely mistake of saying, oh, it's a really quiet week. Nobody really did anything. Um, and he didn't actually go into great detail about what everyone did, just you know, a few things here and there. So I had a look at actually what went on in OBS that week. 
and we had three snapshots, which is still, you know, basically one every two days, with 146 package updates. That was new packages, that was new versions, that was bug fixes, 146 changes to the distribution. In order to fit all of that on the DVD, or to fit the important stuff on the DVD, we had to fit 15 new packages on there. We then had to find 38 to remove that didn't need to be there. And that included a kernel update. With that, it's 118 test runs in order to get all of that stuff out in the hands of users. Dude, that's not quiet. It really just isn't quiet at all. And this is actually a bit more what a typical week is like at the moment. Five snapshots isn't that far off what, we normally, what we're normally doing. 370 package updates is kind of normal for us now. Two kernels is a little bit low. We've had weeks with three or four. And GNOME 320 did their upstream release, and we had it in there in Tumbleweed, fully tested a week after that release. We actually had, had it in staging the week before, but you know we found some bugs, and that was the point. And so we had ended up with 118 different installations all over there. So if you look at the kind of whole family of SUSE and OpenSUSE now, this is, this is how everything is. We have SUSE Linux Enterprise, the nice refined enterprise distribution, all tested with OpenQA. We have Leap, which includes stuff from Tumbleweed, as well as the shared core. And we have Tumbleweed rolling at a constant pace with lots and lots of stuff. So thinking about the future, we've got a lot of stuff on the drawing board at the moment. Uh, we, with the IPMI backend, we're currently only supporting very specific Supermicro devices because we really had to reverse engineer their protocol because it wasn't that well documented. Um, so you can take certain Supermicro machines, tell OpenQA, hey, go here, you go have fun, and it will get the video output and get, do all the serial and everything's fine. We want to keep on extending that, so we want to add more Supermicro devices, more iDRAC stuff. Um, we have an interactive mode. Um, I didn't show it in the web UI because we've just recently completely redone it. Um, but it's still not quite ready, so I'm still going to keep this slide. But the interactive mode at the moment is primarily a needling interactive mode. So the idea is, as you have a new build with some, being some big design change, you can basically tell OpenQA to run in sort of a, a semi-interactive state where it'll run through the tests until it gets to that point where it was looking for a needle. If the needle doesn't match, instead of freaking out and closing the test as failure, it'll just stop and let the developer then pop in, say, okay, that needle's different, and then carry on and keep on going forward. So you can do sort of a mass redesign needling effort very, very quickly. And this is cool, but it's only really cool for OpenQA guys. And I, I really like the idea of expanding on it so we can use interactive mode for being a service for developers and for QA to actually reproduce the bugs. So follow through the same thing, but instead of waiting for a needle to fail, maybe have an arbitrarily defined breakpoint where you know you have a developer says, okay, I want to have a look at that one thing. OpenQA can get to that point automatically. It could stop there or pause there more accurately. And then with OpenQA, we've already got the serial, the SSH, et cetera, hand that all over to the developer. They could pop into the machine, do whatever the heck they want with it throw it all away at the end because we just don't care. And that's something that I really want to see us expand on. You can kind of hack it around already now um, inside SUSE, um, because you have access with the SUSE infrastructure. Um, but inside OpenSUSE, obviously, we have other complications because we're running on a nice secure network. You don't have direct VNC or SSH access to the worker machines. So we're trying to figure out ways of handling that proxies, authentication, blah, all of that kind of role management stuff. I really like the idea of an OpenStack backend, um, even though I've said all the nice stuff about the Kimu backend and the other backends we have. Um, not just because SUSE have products like SUSE Cloud and OpenStack is a very interesting technology, um, which we need to test stuff on. So, you know, do these distributions work in a cloud environment? Um, but also, you know, we're limited by hardware always, and we're always going to be limited by hardware. Having, a having the ability to take tests that don't need to be checking certain hardware things, tests that, that you know, could just run in any cloud environment, throw it to a cloud, let it spin up the VMs it needs, let it throw it away. I really like that idea. And then of course, if I'm doing something like that, let's why not do something similar with Kubernetes? Or why not test Docker, 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 Docker? I kind of just, you know, we could, 
Is anybody interested in writing it? And if you are interested in writing it, this is everything you need to know. The website, oh, which is now wrong. Ah. <laughs> okay, the main domain for OpenQA is now uh, HTTP open.qa, which is a lot easier to remember than that old string. That's also where we have the documentation. And at the moment, we're still using uh, progress.opensuse.org um, as the main feature and bug reporter for, for OpenSUSE OpenQA. Um, we're still trying to figure out what we're going to do with that. And with that, I have 10 minutes for questions. Does anybody have any? Martin. Oh, um, so if anybody does have questions, could you use that microphone and stand over there so it gets on the recording? Great. Do you support touch events? I've always heard only mouse and keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> the, the way we've modeled the mouse events, you could probably get away with treating that like touch. So, you know, uh, the, when it's, I, I accidentally once tested a 42 button mouse. So you can do 42 buttons on a mouse, you can probably do five fingers. Um, so yeah, it, we probably need a little bit of work on the API to handle sort of the, the multi-gestures. Um, and in most cases, we're passing through those events via VNC. So could you pass through the gesture stuff via VNC? Or do you just do something natively for a change and not do it in the VNC stuff? We, we use the VNC stuff like crazy because it's easy. But there's no reason why you couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't handle a different console. That uh, that one example I gave of the select console, we've abstracted all of that various console nonsense away. That's how we handle the VNC, st the IPMI stuff. It's also we, how we handle things like mainframe not having a TTY like a nice X390 machine. So, yeah. Any other questions? Comments, flames, suggestions. Uh-oh, I really shouldn't have said that. <laughs> What's broken now? You don't want to know. One question, you talked about testing software there. Yeah. How do you test OpenQA? We test OpenQA in OpenQA. We don't actually have it running in production right now because I haven't had the time, but we did it. I did it a few hack weeks ago and I really want to see it done you know, very, very soon. So OpenQA can test itself very, very comfortably. Just taking a disk image with OpenSUSE or SLEE installed, installing the packages, making sure they work, loading up the web UI, making sure that's all there, actually checking the job, checking it's all running. It, it's, that was, I, yeah, you kind of need to make sure that your test tool can test itself. If you can do that, you can probably test anything. Anything else? No? Good, thank you very much. <laughs>